Hi, I'm Ron and welcome to Popsicle, where I talk about popular culture, science, and everything in between. In this episode, I'll be talking about the complex relationship between biotechnology and science fiction. By complex, I mean it's really quite interesting and multidimensional. In fact, Cheryl Hamilton wrote about it in a very interesting and very fascinating uh, paper in the Science Fiction Studies Journal. And there she talked about this relationship between science and science fiction, but with particular focus on biotechnology. She argues that biotechnology is that particular uh, field of science where you really see this tense relationship between science and science fiction, where uh, a lot of the perspectives of people on science can be painted by what they see in science fiction, and science provides the foundations for uh, science fiction. So, of course, th these are things that we can say about other uh, fields of science as well, whether it's in biology or in any of the other hard science fields. However, Hamilton argues, quite strongly, I should say, that biotechnology is really uh, a perfect example of that. Just think of the classic examples of technology slash biotechnology, namely Frankenstein and Brave New World, uh, which are classics in the science fiction genre and also touch on the use of technology by humans. In Frankenstein in particular, and this is something that will be echoed in works like The Island of Dr. Moreau, there is that usual trope, that most usual of tropes in science that sees a home really in biotechnology applications, and that is the mad scientist trope. You see here Dr. Frankenstein creating a monster out of different parts. Uh, it's not so much biotechnology, especially because he's using non-living parts, but it is uh, a technological, it is a use of technology and uh, a, a piecing together of things with a definite purpose. And that is something that we can say about biotechnology in general. And Dr. Frankenstein, of course, is a classic example of a mad scientist. And this is what makes biotechnology quite fascinating in science fiction, uh, but also sometimes gives science a sort of questionable flavor to it. For instance, I'm sure you've heard People say when they talk about the, what the, the, the scares behind genetically modified organisms or GMOs that uh, we are going too deeply for comfort into science fiction as if it were a bad thing. When we say we're already going into science fiction with our current science, when we hear that there can be a negative connotation sometimes. And Cheryl Hamilton argues that that negative connotation, which seems to paint uh, science as bad science, science as immoral uh, practice, it, it really appears in biotechnology. Why is that? Uh, that's in large part because in biotechnology, we are dealing with changing the fundamental nature of organisms, whether you're talking about other organisms or humans. Of course, it becomes a much more serious uh, point of concern if it's humans that you are, you are manipulating at the most fundamental level. And when we are talking about the fundamental level, you're talking about the body or even more basic or smaller than the cellular level, the genetic material. Biotechnology is technology that utilizes biological systems, whether whole organisms or parts thereof, to create products products that will have in an application in human society. That's important to take note of. When you talk about technology in general and biotechnology specifically, really the main goal is to be able to contribute to society with a particular application. So this is really the realm of applied sciences and engineering. Uh, when you put the word bio in front of technology, then you are really talking about the use of biological systems or organisms. And so it becomes a much more sensitive type of topic compared to other forms of technology because 
here you are dealing with organisms that have breath and life. So ethics really comes into play. And that is one of the things that makes biotechnology such a fascinating aspect of science and science fiction to talk about. Because when you talk about biotechnology, inevitably you're not going to just talk about the science. You have to talk about the impact on society as well and the ethical concerns. Why is it that a lot of biotechnological applications that are found in science fiction bother us and are things that while possible already to a certain extent on earth are things that we do not practice on a large scale that is mostly a question of ethics and morals and so it's always a fascinating topic when you talk about for example cloning why we are not using doing human cloning yet on a large scale why we are uh, hesitant about some aspects of stem cell usage stem cell regeneration and all of that uh, and why CRISPR Cas9 while being a revolutionary method that can give us leaps and bounds of advancement in medical technology is still something that can be quite worrisome for a lot of people including scientists. It would be good to go through some historical overview of biotechnology. This is going to be my, by no means exhaustive uh, I will save that for a much longer video or uh, an article, a uh, written article. But for now, I'm just going to discuss some of the major trends. Uh, and the great thing about biotechnology as a piece of science fiction is that it really reflects the advances in science and the interest in society uh, during that time. So let's start with Frankenstein, which many scholars and science fiction authors consider to be the first ever science fiction novel. It was published in 1818, some 50 or so years after the onset of the Industrial Revolution, where the emphasis has been on mass production, assembly lines, the use of steam engines and electricity and coal, and all of that. And that those ideas really permeate into the, the environment which you find in Frankenstein, which is a Promethean tale of the creation of artificial life. This is something, of course, that we will revisit in many, many future science fiction novels and will also reflect some of the fears uh, in advancements in genetics and genetic engineering. Uh, for instance, we will see later that when we talk about GMOs and the scare uh, about GMOs, the term Frankenfoods was coined at one time to uh, invoke the fear of a Frankenstein's monster on the creation of gen genetically modified food that we are being invited to eat, to put on our dinner table and eat. We could really say that biotechnology began to pick up and, and uh, pick up a lot of steam in, uh, in media in the 1970s onward. In the 1970s and the 1980s, you began to see a lot of integration of biological uh, systems into science fiction, particularly in the form of cyborgs and androids and, and artificial intelligence or artificial life. Um, and this was uh, informed by a lot of discoveries on in the biological fields in the 70s, particularly because of the molecular revolution. You know, the uh, further understanding of DNA and genes and how they work. And so it was it's easy to understand why this became a go-to of a lot of science fiction authors. Even prior to Jurassic Park being very, very popular because of cloning, you had a lot of more superficial applications first, cybernetic implements. In the 1980s, you had a lot of sci-fi being characterized by themes of alienation, existentialism, what it means to be a human in a changing, technologically driven world and how technology will drive our humanity in the future. And so there's a lot of aspects of the, the, the theme of the fear of the machine also coming into play. William Gibson in his classic 1984 novel Neuromancer really touched on this very well because this was set in a society where technology has run rampant and basically rules over uh, not only society but also the individual biology of human beings. You have this scene in cybernetic implants and storage of information that is already linked with the, with the 
with the biology, with the, with the physiology of the human body. And this is a theme that will be revisited in a lot of different future science fiction texts. In fact, we can say that uh, Neuromancer anticipates very well such pieces as The Matrix and Blade Runner and the Shadowrun uh, series of games. Uh, not only in terms of the dark noir aspect of Shadowrun, but also, of course, more, uh, more primarily in terms of the use of biotechnology as a major driving force and a major novo in these universes. Cyborgs are uh, very prominent in 1980 science fiction. You can see this in Robocop. You can see this, of course, in Terminator. To a certain extent, the replicants in the brilliant classic Blade Runner are a type of android slash cyborg. Uh, they're not necessarily cyborgs in the sense of the word uh, where, uh, in how we accept it now, where we say that cyborgs are essentially humans with cybernetic or technological implants that are meant to improve their lives. That's really how we define cyborgs nowadays. Uh, cyborg in uh, the DC Comics is a good example of that. He starts off being human, but then you have the implants. The Blade Runner replicants do not start off being humans. They're, they're machines with a coating of real skin, but then they are beginning to develop emotions and intelligence akin to that of real humans. So it's somewhat more similar to what you see in um, Westworld, in the modern Westworld incarnations in the TV series in HBO. And of course, it invokes also fears of uh, cyborgs like the Cybermen of Doctor Who and the Cylons of Battlestar Galactica. Uh, it's very easy to imagine cyborgs eventually overrunning humans because machines are replicable. Uh, it's easy to create machines. Self-replication is something that's uh, still uh, beyond the capability of most machines, although some some replication, uh, some small replications have been uh, shown to be doable by machines if they have copies of the materials av made available to them. But as for now, machines are not capable of spontaneously producing new material from themselves that will allow them to create new offspring. <laughs> when, when, when we reach that level of technology, that's, that's when uh, the nightmares of being overrun by robots and cyborgs will really come into play. Earlier, I had given the definition of cyborgs where you have humans that have technological implants. It's important to mention that these implants must be interfacing with the nervous system. Uh, having a prosthetic limb, which we've had for many, many decades, does not make you a cyborg. If it's just a purely prosthetic limb that doesn't interface with your nervous system. But if you have cochlear implants or eye implants or the sea leg, uh, which does have an interface with your nervous system, thus allowing you to control these prosthetics with your brain, then that is true cybernetic implantation or cybernetic enhancement. And this is what such groups as the Cyborg Foundation are really advocating. And there is such a thing. There are real cyborgs. For instance, Neil Harbison is probably the most popular cyborg of them all. He has what is called an eyeborg on top of his head. He was born colorblind, and this uh, implement that he has on his head, which is interfaced with his brain, attached to his nervous system, allows him to see color through sound. Uh, essentially, colors create a sound, a particular sound, based on the frequency, which is then delivered to his auditory, uh, to the auditory parts of his brain, thereby allowing him to interpret colors through sound and in fact he creates he holds concerts sometimes where he is able to convert sound into splashes of color uh, that the that the audience can see and this makes him uh, a cyborg this ability this this uh, synesthesia which is artificially induced uh, and the fact that he is uh, that his passport photo includes the eyeboard makes him a legal official cyborg now, uh, several science fiction authors have argued that uh, the age of cyberpunk, where we have cybernetics being uh, being integrated into biology, is something that we're leaving behind thematically 
not only in science fiction but even in science. Later, we will see that there are some more advancements in the interface between computers and biology but not so much in the form of cyborgs. But before that, we go into the more revolutionary aspects of biotech, particularly those that really uh, uh, increased in significantly in popularity in the 1990s with uh, such works as Jurassic Park. And this is where you have genetic engineering. So we, we have a pretty complicated relationship with our genes because it's so basic to what we are or so fundamental to what we are. There is a fundamental fear of genes being manipulated and thus our bodies being manipulated beyond our control also. This in fact explains a lot of the uh, horror behind science fiction horror hybrids in film that have a genetic component to them. For example, in the, in the 1950s, particularly during the Cold War, there was a significant slew of, of, of uh, films where where animals were mutated by science. And so you see there the fear of genes and also the fear of the other, of course, which is what, which was a prominent thing in the, in the fear-fueled 1950s of the Cold War era. Uh, for example, the film Them, which featured giant ants. That's a classic in, in, in uh, frightful genetics. And so this idea would be taken further, not always in a horror slant, but, uh, but in more science fiction, in the 1990s and onward. And there are many staples to genetic engineering stories. Of course, you have Gataka being a primary one in terms of genetic therapy or gene therapy, where we begin to see a future where you are able to filter out traits that you would not want to see in your offspring. And there's a tailor-made uh, uh, industry of producing offspring. There's directional evolution, in a sense, through preferences by humans. And this has proven to be disturbing to a lot of people, uh, this potential, which is made only more possible by such innovations as CRISPR-Cas9, which is a wonderful advanced method of fixing genes or um, manipulating genetic material so as to be able to come up with so many different innovations particularly in the medical field uh, but understandably there are fears as to where this will take us because it's one thing to want to get rid of diseases that can be uh, solved early on through genetic manipulation and it's another thing to purely want cosmetic changes like having blue eyes or having white skin uh, through genetic engineering. I mentioned a while ago the frankenfoods that's still a legitimate fear among certain people. Not everyone is ready to accept uh, the proliferation of GMOs in markets, especially in food. The frankenfood scare uh, was quite intense in the 90s and the early 2000s. Nowadays, not so much, although it's still quite rampant in a few places. And there is an inherent fear of putting into your body something that has been genetically changed or manipulated in laboratories. However, practically all legitimate evidence that is available from the scientific community has shown that GMOs that are available in the market are not harmful to human health. And so, in general, we can put that to rest. But that is not to say, of course, that there are no potential risks to, ge to genetically modifying organisms. When we genetically modify organisms, we are creating what are called transgenic organisms, usually. This means that we are transferring genes of interest from one organism to another. For example, if we want to produce glowing rabbits, uh, which is something that's real, it's not fictional anymore, and this is used for some biomedical applications, we uh, insert the gene from uh, a glowing jellyfish into the genes of the subject animal. And that's why we have glowing fish, glowing rabbits, glowing cats for various purposes. Genetic engineering is a favorite trope in science fiction. Not only in mad scientist trope heavy sci-fi um, because uh, there's something really fascinating about the idea of splicing together the most fundamental unit of life which is the gene. Uh, I mean going beyond the cell which is the real basic functional unit and, and something that provides or, or determines the identity, the very core of the identity 
of an organism and then combining them together. That introduces all sorts of nova. Uh, because if you think about one organism having uh, essentially its identity being determined by its genetic material, what does that imply about a new, an entirely new organism which is a combination of different identities? Right? So it's very interesting from both a biological and a literary perspective. And of course, there's a lot of room for horror there also because there are a lot of unpredictable things that can happen from splicing together organisms that are not really meant to be combined. Essentially, each and every species is meant to be its own independent unit that is not able to procreate with other species. And in a film like Splice, where the combinations are really weird, it's a trans uh, dren, it's a transgenic organism that's a combination of not only various animals, but even, I believe, some plant material, then you come up with a very uh, fascinatingly uh, potentially horrifying creature that's very unpredictable in terms of its anatomy and in terms of its behavior, as we had seen in the final disturbing sequences of the film. And that's actually a... A good example of a sci-fi picture that falls into the mad science category. Now, there are a lot of other genetic engineering movies that uh, don't really fall into the mad science category are, and are more um, reflections of social issues. Uh, for example, when you talk about food security and um, the, the greed of corporations, and the greed of society in general. Okja is a pretty good example. Um, we, we are meant to be sympathetic to Okja and to uh, the people who are protecting Okja. Uh, but this is all made in the backdrop of a social reality, which is that corporations are driving uh, genetic engineering and uh, not necessarily providing these to the public as they should because biotechnology is a public uh, affair and a public responsibility. Um, there are certain companies that I will not mention right now that are very, very big in producing GMOs but it's very controversial in how they handle uh, the licensing and uh, patenting of these GMOs and making them available to farmers, for instance, that would benefit from the use of these uh, of these crops. The thing is we've been using biotech crops for quite a long time. Uh, corn, for example, and also soy uh, are two of the biggest crops that have benefited from genetic engineering. Uh, one, one primary example is, is Bt corn, which is uh, corn that has been uh, treated with genetic material from a particular bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, which uh, with the process of which introduces uh, toxicity to the corn against the corn borer, the European corn borer, which is the caterpillar of an insect that consumes a lot of corn. But the introduction of that gene from Bacillus uh, makes them toxic to the corn borers, thus protecting the corn, which would ultimately be good for food security. For humans but understandably there are a lot of uh, fears of certain people even within the scientific community sometimes of gmos again uh, some being driven to call them franken foods because they're artificial they're synthesized in the lab their genes are messed around with so there's some unpredictability or uncertainty about what they will do with the human body this scare on food is quite common uh, there was a time in the 90s i believe when kfc uh, was a was a target of fear mongering. Uh, th there were questions as to whether they were using real chickens. There was even a, a rumor at one point that they were using uh, chickens that were just legs and breasts and no heads. And then what blood was being pumped into them artificially. Uh, a scary thought, which has long been refuted already uh, by KFC and then several reputable sources. But this is something that sci-fi keeps on going back to. For instance, George R. R. Martin's Tough Voyaging anthology of series starring Haviland Tough as the central character um, features Haviland Tough, a person who owns a seed ship, uh, which is a ship that basically contains a library of genetic material from 
uh, virtually all known uh, life forms from across the, the thousand worlds universe of George R. R. Martin. And so he is able to create clones and hybrids of all sorts. And in one particular story in that anthology, creates a, basically a mound of meat uh, that is meant to solve the uh, food shortage problem of a particular planet that he visits. And then in the uh, modern classic Oryx and Creek, which is part of the Mad Adam trilogy of um, uh, renowned author Margaret Atwood, Oryx and Creek is set in a future where society has become very, very dependent on biotechnology to the extent that bioengineers are held in very high uh, regard and even food security is a problem that is being directly addressed by biotechnology. We have the Chicky Nubs, which is very, very similar to the controversy of KFC before, which makes me think Margaret Atwood probably really used that as an inspiration. And this is a major source of food in this setting. And it sort of solves uh, many of the problems of food security. Uh, it's not the most pleasant thing to imagine eating, but at least it's nutritious and it's readily available. But aside from that, we also have xenotransplantation as one of the most fascinating things in Oryx and Creek. And this is seen mostly in the Pigun, which is uh, as much of a character as the main uh, characters are in this book. Piguns are genetically engineered pigs that contain human organs. In fact, it's said that they have some aspects of human intelligence, therefore making them a bit unpredictable and crafty. Uh, and so there's a, they're a force to reckon with in the story. Piguns are products of xenotransplantation, which is something that's been in the realm of science fiction for quite a long time, but nowadays it isn't because we are developing chimeric pig uh, embryos with genetic material from humans so that they'd be able to create organs that are usable for transplantation to humans. This is a technology that we are really seeing now. And so it's not a very far away future where we are farming pigs with human organs. Many of these innovations that we are looking forward to from sci-fi are becoming much more realistic and beginning to see more light uh, in, in the view of having this groundbreaking technology called CRISPR-Cas9, which is a gene editing technique that basically allows scientists to snip particular parts of a genetic material and introduce new genetic material through the natural activity of, of certain microorganisms and enzymes. Uh, and, and sort of uh, reverse engineering this process enables us to come up with all sorts of genetic products that can potentially solve so many different medical problems. So it's very, very promising. But as we had mentioned earlier in the context of Gataka, uh, the main ethical concern here is that this level of technology and the level of potential that it has needs policing because it might end up being used in less than socially significant uh, functions such as, for example, again, purely cosmetic purposes that would, um, that would ultimately cause a greater divide between different, uh, across different lines uh, among humans. And, you know, it's in this time of, of, of uncertainty and division, we need less of the things that will divide us and more of the things that will unite us. Of course, one of the other more fascinating and common tropes in science fiction that have to do with biotechnology is the process of cloning. There are several types of cloning actually that we do, some of which are less controversial than others. Using polymerase chain reaction or PCR, which is very, very common in forensics and medical technology, and even in the study of diseases like COVID-19, uh, that is not controversial at all. We just basically amplify existing genetic material for various purposes. However, uh, there are two types of cloning that are quite uh, controversial. There's therapeutic and reproductive cloning. Therapeutic cloning essentially involves the use of stem cells, which are controversial only or primarily when stem cells from uh, embryos are used because the process of extracting stem cells from the embryos 
uh, essentially kills the embryo and there's that question of embryos already having life. Whereas adult stem cells are much less controversial in their use because they're taken from adults and that doesn't kill the adult. Reproductive cloning, which is the third type of cloning, is even more controversial and is less practiced in actual scientific protocols. This is production of clones of whole organisms. So all of the things that you've read and watched about human cloning are a type of reproductive cloning. There are many ethical issues about it, primarily revolving around the procedures that are involved in creating the clones because they're not perfect and they can lead to a lot of different complications. As we had seen with the example of Dolly, the sheep, who was created in the laboratory in the 1990s, the late 1990s, and created quite a stir in, in community. In, in fact, Cheryl Hamilton mentions this particular example as one of those incidents that really started people talking about biotechnology and the scares that people had, uh, the, the fears that people had on the products of biotechnology. Uh, there were people saying, if we can do this to sheep, we will we'll probably be able to do this to humans very soon and it's a scary prospect for a lot of people having human clones walking around as we had seen with the process involved in creating uh, uh, dolly which is called the somatic cell nuclear transfer or scnt there are complications like it can lead to overly large organs or overly large organisms and the age works differently from what we're accustomed to because the thing about the SCNT process is that the clone is chromosomally and genetically as old as the donor. What does that mean? If the donor, for example, the one that you want to clone is 50 years old, then the clone that you produce, which will of course start off as a baby and not as a complete adult, which is a very sci-fi, bad science uh, trope in some uh, sci-fi pieces that feature cloning, the baby will be a baby uh, for all intents and purposes except in terms of its chromosomes. Chromosomally, it is already 50 years old. And so if the life expectancy of, uh, of humans in, in, on the average is 75, then that baby will live only up to around 25 years. That's the implication of it. SCNT basically involves the following steps. First, you get a donor egg cell from a female then the nucleus of that egg cell is removed. And then in its place, you have the genetic material coming from the somatic cells or the body cells of the donor, the one that you want to clone. And then this egg cell is stimulated to divide on its own through electrical and chemical stimulation. And it's a type of parthenogenesis in a way, but it will divide uh, or start dividing into an actual diploid uh, and produce a diploid zygote. And that diploid zygote will become a fetus, become a, become a human, and that human is a clone of, of course, the donor. However, if you know your genetics, then you'd know that it is not a perfect clone because some of our traits are taken from mitochondrial DNA, which exists outside the nucleus. Remember that only the nucleus of the surrogate egg cell was removed. And so some of the traits of the baby, of the clone, will be from the mitochondrion of the surrogate mother and not from the donor. And so it will not be a perfect clone. Cloning has been used in sci-fi to explore many different themes. For example, Never Let Me Go, an excellent book by Kazuo Ishiguro, which was adapted into an excellent movie, uh, explores humanity, the nature of humanity and the soul. Whereas uh, literature, uh, literary pieces like Nine Lives by Ursula Le Guin and even Neon Genesis Evangelion have explored the concept of individuality. What does being a true individual mean and what does having a clone mean in relation to you as the real donor, as the individual? And then there are uh, science fiction um, creations that talk about clones as products, as commodities. And this is something that Orphan Black uh, very beautifully touches on throughout the series. And uh, so cloning is one of the most interesting sci-fi tropes that have to do with biotechnology because there's the question of all of these things that have to do with the human as an individual and the human as a member of society.
Because think about it, what will be the legal and social implications of humans having clones? And then what are the ethical implications of having an organ farm basically among clones, which is the plot of Never Let Me Go? Producing clones just for the purpose of harvesting organs from them. Is that ethical? Or does that even matter because they're clones and not real humans? What does being a real human mean as opposed to being a clone? In many sci-fi creations, clones tend to be sterile. This is something that we see in Never Let Me Go and also in Nine Lives. So is sterility or fertility uh, something that defines humanity? Most of the modern sci-fi that touches on biotech nowadays are about consciousness, human consciousness and prolonging human life, probably not in the shell that we have, the body, but in some form where the mind is allowed to outlive the body that has housed it. This is immortality and consciousness in a lot of sci-fi. Uh, for instance, the concept of brain ship is a very fascinating one that was started by many authors decades before, Anne McCaffrey being one of them in her Brain and Brawn series. But Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie is one of the form of one of the more famous ones and one of the more well-reputed ones, having won so many different awards. Here you have the concept of the human consciousness being transplanted into a ship so that the ship is actually driven by a human mind. It's not always about transferring human consciousness into ships or something inanimate. It really has to do with merging human consciousness with computers. And that shouldn't be surprising because the nervous system actually works a lot on the basis of electrical signals. The signals that are fired within each and every neuron that we have is electrical in nature and so are the signals that are found in computers. And in fact, this has been done before. There have been several experiments which have shown humans having an interface with computers, with the internet, and being able to uh, remotely control machines by using their mind and thinking about it and that machine having an interface also with the same computer. And so it's telekinesis but through computers. And you can imagine how fascinating that is for a lot of scientists. But also, of course, again, it's a, it's a matter of the concept of uploading the whole human mind and consciousness and cognition and memory and all of those abstract things into a computer or into another body. This is something that we see in Avatar with Jake Sully transferring his consciousness into the body, into the empty body and the shell of a Navi. And we see this in Altered Carbon with the concept of sleeves. What makes it rather impractical at this moment is that we haven't completely understood the human brain yet. Especially those more abstract concepts like consciousness and memory. How are those even copied by computers? How does that even translate into something that can be copied by machines? We're not absolutely sure. Mapping the brain is something that we've been trying to do for quite some time. And we haven't really determined all that there is to determine about the functions of the different parts of the brain and the many features that it has. So it's going to be very tough to, to replicate all of that into a machine. How much of it will be lost in translation? How much of the humanity and the personality will be lost in the translation from body to machine? That's one of the most fascinating modern questions in biotechnology in science fiction but we always have the cloning and the genetic engineering and cyborgs to enjoy in science fiction because these all have to do with manipulating the human body and when we talk about manipulating the human body that might remind you of body horror and it shouldn't surprise you then that there are so many examples of biotechnology that, that touch on uh, body horror like the fly and splice being just two of them it's a fertile ground for creativity of science fiction authors but there's also a lot to play around with for scientists scientists can take a lot of inspiration from the imagination of science fiction just as science fiction authors have fertile ground in the creativity and passion and of course the technical know-how of 
scientists. And this is something to celebrate. If you like that video about biotechnology and you would like to hear more about the merging of popular culture and science, don't forget to subscribe to Popsicle so that you may be alerted to new content. See you again next time!